Harry's wife, a pair of juveniles. Harry's wife, of course, believes that she is the most interesting person in the world, that everything that she does is of note, is of significance, and is of moment. Those that have a brain, and of course those that understand that she is a narcissist, realise that she's banal, beige, grandiose, but with no basis for doing so, boring. Of course, plenty of people talk about her because they often can't understand how she can carry on behaving the way that she does. And there are a lot, they are at a loss to explain her behaviours. Of course, if they understood narcissism, they would know full well why she does as she does and why she doesn't stop. Others, of course, revel in pointing out her contradictions, her lies, her revisions of history. And although they may not necessarily recognise that it's because of her narcissism, they keep on pointing out that her behaviour is despicable unpleasant, that she's treacherous, not to be trusted. Thus, even though she offers nothing, she offers plenty to dissect, and, on a near-daily basis, causes stuff to be written about her, or has stuff written about her, which allows us to further understand the various facets of her narcissism in action. This has been identified further by Newt Gingrich in his article for foxnews.com, a little while ago in this month, stating, there's no mystery to Harry's wife, Prince Harry, meet two juveniles who can't deal with the real world. Now, is Mr Gingrich right about that, in terms of that being the reason for their behaviour, that they just can't deal with the real world? Well, to an extent, yes. Harry can't deal with the real world because he's told that he's owed the world, that that was something that was embedded in him to a degree as a consequence of the fact that he grew up in the royal family and then as a consequence of the way that his wife manipulates him he has been told time and time again uh, that he should be entitled to a particular outcome that he has for too long has put up with being the spare and therefore he deserves elevation and status she of course can't handle the real world when the real world tells her no when the real world points out that she's a talentless nobody, when the real world demonstrates that whatever she turns her hand to, she doesn't succeed with it, and that she is transparent, see-through, and an unlikable individual. She can't handle the real world when the real world points out, you are a bully. She can't handle the real world when the real world says, no, you're not allowed to do it that way, you have to do it this way. And the reason she can't handle the real world, of course, is as a consequence of her embedded and innate need for control, part of her narcissism. But let's find out what Mr Gingrich has to write. OK, I will admit it. My wife Callista and I got drawn into the six-part Netflix series on Prince Harry and Harry's wife. The opening music is reminiscent of Downton Abbey, which we adore and constantly rewatch. It's like an old friend. We were once lucky enough to have Lady Carnarvon take us through Highclere Castle and share scones and coffee with us. It was magic. Harry and Harry's wife as a series is not, repeat not, magic. It is the home movie coverage of a train wreck. Loving friends are interviewed about the horrible experience Harry's wife and Harry have had at the hands of the wicked staff of the institution. They also bemoan the sheer jealousy of the royals. Don't you love that term? Americans always have a secret thing for the family they rebelled against and defeated for our independence. Callista and I have a bias in favour of the royals because we watched The Crown and enjoyed the marvellous performance by Helen Mirren as late Queen Elizabeth in The Appointment. That is a play about the weekly appointment the Queen had with each of her Prime Ministers, starting with Winston Churchill. Former Prime Minister Tony Blair once told me that he was amazed how much Queen Elizabeth had learned over the years and how helpful her advice was. So we watched the self-pitying, whining and cringe-inducing explanations of how marrying into a monarchy had brutalised Harry's wife and how poor Harry had never gotten over being born second and watching his older brother William be groomed to be king. I felt I was watching two juveniles who simply could not come to grips with the real world. 
In actual fact, Mr Gingrich, what you're witnessing is a narcissist that can't come to the grips with the real world saying no and her prisoner, totally beholden to the nonsense that she peddles. The article continues. It is a little suspicious that they had just happened to have so many hours of home movies. It made me wonder if they had been planning this TV extravaganza for a long time. There were reports almost as soon as they resigned from their royal duties that they had signed a $100 million contract with Netflix. Of course, the series explains why they need the money. Staying in a 22-acre estate in Los Angeles, ensuring enough security, travelling in private airplanes, all these aspects of the simple life add up. Grandiosity, of course. As I watched the series, it became clear that Harry's wife was a professional actress. She delivered her lines, occasionally had a tear, and paused at the right moments for the right amount of time. All forms of manipulation, of course. In all fairness, the most poignant and real parts of the series were Harry's flashbacks to his mother, and the impact Princess Diana's estrangement from the royal family and her death had on him as a child. His memories of his mother and the clips of her interviews in which Princess Diana described how the royal family mistreated her are compelling. They help us understand how easy it was for Harry and Harry's wife to cast themselves as the next generation of the same trauma. In a sense, Harry and Harry's wife are reliving the tragedy of Princess Diana as their own experience. Harry does it because he's been encouraged to do so by his wife, of course. And she does it because she engages in character trait acquisition by virtue of the Diana duplication. Mr. Gingrich continues, However, I found it hard to feel sympathy for a couple who have had almost everything. When Harry's wife described the estrangement from her father, I wondered if at least a little of that isn't a comment on her. Well, indeed it is. It's the assertion of control by withdrawal. When Harry described the wicked staff at the palace leaking attacks, I wondered about the value of all the good things the palace had done. There is a telling moment early on when the Queen rejected Harry and Harry's wife's request to live in Windsor Castle and instead gave them Frogmore Cottage. Only when I looked it up did I learn it has ten bedrooms. So being denied Windsor Castle and forced into a ten-bedroom mansion, which they call a cottage, set the stage for Harry's wife's feeling of alienation, really. Of course, that demonstrates her grandiosity and sense of entitlement. You may want to watch the series for yourself. It's a nice break from the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Iranian effort to get nuclear weapons, the North Korean ballistic missile launches, the excruciatingly petty conflicts and gossip of Washington politics, and in our case, the tragic grip, the Green Bay Packers season. You may find yourself rooting for Harry and Harry's wife in their desperate search for happiness in a cold world of nasty royal family staff and vicious British newspapers. A little something to do during the holidays. This, of course, demonstrates the petty nature of Harry's wife and how she doesn't see that that's how she is viewed. And, yet again, another commentator identifying the self-indulgent tosh that this series is and panning it accordingly. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.